And like many animals that came to dominate certain time periods, the dinosaurs appeared out of the ashes of a mass extinction, the Great Dying that marked the end of the Permian and the beginning of the Triassic. Among many of these bizarre experiments of evolution that were common in the Triassic was a tiny advanced carnivore that would eventually go on to dominate the Earth for the next 160 million years. It is common knowledge that the dinosaurs first appeared in the Triassic, but they were actually not seen until almost halfway through the period. The Triassic was filled with very strange animals like the tree-dwelling Drapanosaurs, or the reverse pterosaur, Charavipteryx. However, the dominating animals in the early Triassic were advanced reptiles known as archosaurs. These creatures had actually existed since the late Permian, but were obscure and rarely seen. In the Triassic, they rose up and took control as the dominant predatory animals, as well as occupying some herbivorous niches. The reasons for their success is usually attributed to the conditions that were left over from the Permian extinction. Oxygen levels were low in the early stages, and conditions were primarily arid throughout the Triassic. It is thought that the archosaurs had more advanced respiratory systems than many other animals of the time, and were better at conserving water. These unique and invaluable tools allowed them to become the most feared predators of the early Triassic. Quite soon after their first appearance, the archosaurs split into two groups, the Pseudosuchia and the Ornithodira. The Pseudosuchia group contained animals that would eventually evolve into crocodiles, and the Ornithodira group contained animals that would eventually evolve into dinosaurs. But at this time in their history, you would find it very difficult to distinguish them, as the crocodile group were behaving very strangely for crocodiles, like occasionally walking on two legs, or sometimes even being herbivorous. If you travelled back to the early Triassic and were eaten, chances are you wouldn't know if you were eaten by a crocodile or a dinosaur. The most common way in which paleontologists tell these two groups apart is by their ankles. Pseudosuchia had a greater range of motion in their ankles, as many of them had limbs sprawled out to their sides, and others were able to transition from a sprawl into a more upright position if need be. Ornithodirans, on the other hand, had ankles that only really allowed them to move their feet on a single plane, which gave them much more stability while running upright, especially while moving at speed. This adaptation may have been important in allowing the most derived forms to become permanent bipeds, and to become more dinosaur-like and different groups seem to have evolved to spend at least some of their time on two legs independently. This move towards bipedalism among these dinosaur ancestors was probably driven due to the different bills these animals had. They had stronger and very muscular tails, also their bodies moved more easily side to side. So the most efficient form of locomotion while moving at speed may have been on two legs. This is an adaptation being copied by some lizards today, that while moving at speed opt to run on their hind legs. The Ornithodirans are also thought to contain pterosaurs, which would have diverged away from this group just before they started to look very dinosaur-like. Animals like Marasuchus, for instance, looked like small theropod dinosaurs, and were probably permanently bipedal, but these animals still had some primitive features. Acillosaurus still had long forelimbs, showing their quadrupedal ancestry. These animals looked a lot like small theropod dinosaurs, however, do not meet the current definition of dinosaur, and are named dinosauromorphs, the closest relatives of the dinosaurs. Over the years, the animals that hold the title dinosaur has actually changed quite a bit, as our understanding of what these creatures were, and how the world works has improved significantly. When pioneering paleontologists first started to study their fossils, important concepts such as deep time, extinction, and even evolution were only just starting to take hold. Dinosaurs were thought to be any large lizard-like animal that lived a long time ago, and as more prehistoric animals were being discovered, a word with this definition would have been stretched into uselessness. The definition most commonly used today is the common ancestor of the two major dinosaur groups, Cerischia and Ornithischia, and all their descendants. This is because the Iguanodon was an Ornithischia, and the Megalosaurus was a Saurischia, which were both the first dinosaurs ever named, named by Richard Owen, who coined the word dinosaur. The most likely candidate for this common ancestor, and therefore the probable first dinosaur, is believed to be Eoraptor, that lived over 230 million years ago. Dinosaurs may have appeared as early as 243 million years ago, evidenced by the remains of Nyasasaurus, although this creature is only known from fragmentary remains, so it is difficult to know if it was indeed a dinosaur or just a dinosauromorph. So the earliest dinosaurs were small, sometimes tiny bipedal carnivores, and were far from the dominant group of animals, or even predatory animals. Their habitats were largely populated by various types of archosaurs, the dominant carnivores still being the Pseudosuchia that were more successful than dinosaurs well past the mid-Triassic. Adding to this, most early dinosaurs were around the size of a small dog, whereas some Pseudosuchians like the Saurosuchus were 7 meters long, however could have been even larger, with upper estimates of 8 or 9 meters. 
The dinosaurs were not dominating herbivore niches either, but their niches were not being filled by archosaurs and instead were largely being occupied by the same creatures as before the Permian extinction, synapsids. These were ancient creatures with an ancestry dating back to 300 million years ago, and were not reptiles at all, but actually distant mammal relatives. A group of these animals called decinodonts had diversified into many species and were the most common large herbivores of their time by far. However, this would start to change about 230 million years ago with the appearance of small dinosaurs that unlike their predecessors, were adapted to eat plants. One of these individuals was about the size of a large dog called Chromagosaurus that would have lived in the shadow of these cow-sized decinodonts. But these creatures were actually the ancestors of the largest land animals ever, the sauropods. These sauropod ancestors would start to reach large sizes by the end of the Triassic, although nothing compared to their gargantuan Jurassic proportions. Some of these animals like Platyosaurus could already reach lengths of 10 meters by the end of the Triassic when they would start replacing the decinodonts as the dominant herbivores. Most Triassic habitats around the world were monopolized by the large Pseudosuchians. About 230 million years ago in what is modern day South America, a group of dinosaurs called Herorosaurids first appeared. This group were among some of the first dinosaurs, and some members like Herorosaurus that the family is named after, were some of the first large predatory dinosaurs, reaching lengths of about 6 meters. This predator would have had a much lighter build than some of the large Pseudosuchians, but would have been faster and more agile, some of the key dinosaurian advantages. True change came in the form of another mass extinction that occurred 200 million years ago, marking the boundary between the Triassic and Jurassic periods. The Triassic-Jurassic extinction event is lesser known than some of the others, but was actually quite bad, killing off as much as 30% of animals. The majority of the old reptiles, the Pseudosuchians and the Decinodonts were wiped out, leaving a land fauna of dinosaurs, pterosaurs, turtles and small mammals. This extinction event was caused by increasing volcanic activity, and unfortunately why the dinosaurs survived while lots of the other groups did not is still poorly understood. However, it is very plausible that their highly efficient bird-like lungs may have helped them during lower oxygen levels. Although this extinction event was important to dinosaur evolution, it was not analogous to the KT extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs allowing the mammals to rise up, where mammals were for the most part tiny or nocturnal, living in the shadow of dinosaurs, and then in a blink of an eye were able to colonize many new habitats. Some Triassic dinosaurs like Coelophysis are known from hundreds of fossils and were one of the most numerous prehistoric animals in the fossil record. Dinosaurs were common and successful animals by the end of the Triassic. This extinction event just made a common group of animals become nearly every land animal larger than a cat. The extinction event did seal the fate of the Pseudosuchians, or at least the ones that hunted on land. One group of Pseudosuchians still remained dominant in their habitat of freshwater rivers and lakes past the extinction, and unlike the non-avian dinosaurs they still survive today. These, of course, were the ancestors of crocodiles. A massive thank you goes to Fossilworth, David van der Roost, Karim, and all my other patrons for their support. If you would like to support me as well, then you can go to Patreon and make a pledge. If you liked the video and would like to be updated of future content, then consider subscribing. Thank you for watching.